Last summer, one of the major newspapers in my state ran a front page article on debates about teaching critical race theory in schools. Minnesota has a divided government, so banning CRT probably won't happen here, at least not statewide. But the article made clear that we'll be hearing more about it. The article quoted Minnesota Representative and National Republican Congressional Committee Chair Tom Emmer saying, Parents all over the country have been mobilized because they do not want their children being taught that they are automatically racist because of their skin color. I fully expect Democrats' support for this controversial theory to be at the center of 2022 campaigns. He was right. Anti-CRT laws are springing up all over the country. Since the CRT conversation can affect how and what history is taught, I thought I might offer a few thoughts about our current debate. I'm tempted here to first define critical race theory, but I'm actually not going to. First, I don't want to give the impression that I know that much about critical race theory. I don't. Second, I don't think the people who are pushing anti-CRT laws are that interested in a careful definition so much as in a political rallying cry. Chris Rufo, an associate at the Manhattan Institute, who's been at the forefront of the anti-CRT movement, was very clear about the strategy in a series of tweets. He wrote, We have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under the brand category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. Rufo's strategy is a political strategy, identifying crazy things, whatever that means to him, and placing them all under the rubric of critical race theory so you can campaign against them. Third, we don't have to define CRT in order to look at what the anti-CRT laws say and what they actually prohibit. And that's my project. I want to look at what the laws actually say and consider what they mean for teaching history accurately. So, spoiler alert, I think the laws inhibit, at the very least, teaching history well and accurately. In some cases, I think they outlaw teaching accurate, widely acceptable historical interpretations, and in other cases are so poorly written that it's hard to know what interpretations they do and do not allow. Now, you might be a little confused by the term historical interpretations. Does that mean I don't think history is about facts? Am I one of those people who doesn't believe in truth? Well, no. But I think many of us have a bad idea of what the discipline of history is. Many of us remember learning history as a bunch of facts. Columbus sailed in 1492, the Emancipation Proclamation took effect in 1863, and so on. But listing facts is not what historians do. History is a discipline in which we look at the artifacts and evidence we have about the past and try to put them together in a coherent narrative. And that's why historians can disagree. There are different ways to tell the story based on the artifacts and data we have. That's not to say that all the ways of telling the story are equally good. Go to any meeting of historians and you will see that we absolutely think that there are some better ways of putting together the narrative. But we're trying to make sense of lots of data, so there will be different interpretations. When I say that the laws make teaching history hard, I'm saying they inhibit or prohibit teaching interpretations that many historians agree account well for the facts. My first example comes from North Dakota and Florida, both of which have similar language in their laws. Both states forbid teaching critical race theory and then they do something commendable. They define it. Their language only differs slightly, so here's Florida. Critical race theory is the theory that racism is not merely the product of prejudice, but that racism is embedded in American society and its legal systems in order to uphold the supremacy of white persons. Well, that's certainly clearer than a brand I can make mean any crazy thing I want. But here's the problem. According to many historians, racism is not merely the product of prejudice and has been embedded in American society and its legal systems. In other words, these laws prohibit teaching well-sourced and long-standing interpretations. To understand why, I'm going to think about the relationship among race, racism, and slavery. 
Many of us were taught about the history of slavery in a way compliant with these laws. We were taught that white colonists enslaved black people because the colonists were racist. In other words, racism made race-based slavery possible, and prejudice alone is the root of our ills. Many historians, however, argue that racism made slavery, prejudice makes racism is exactly backwards. As historian Barbara Fields has argued, the racism leads to slavery argument seems to suggest that people have always felt some affinity to people of their own race and are therefore unwilling to do bad things to them. Yet we know that's false. People of what we would consider the same race have enslaved each other in other times and places. Race alone doesn't account for who people are willing and not willing to enslave, hurt, and kill. That's not to say that people don't have prejudices against those who they perceive as different. Sure. But the lines of difference aren't always racial. They can be national, religious, or classist. When we look at the history of slavery and racism in this country, we need an explanation that explains why what became known as being black eventually marked those deemed fit for slavery, or in the case of free black people, unworthy of full citizenship rights. So if racism didn't produce slavery, what did? Well, according to some historians, greed largely produced slavery, and slavery in the New World produced race and racism. Historian Ira Berlin argued that the design of American captivity was the extraction of labor that allowed a small group of men to dominate all. In short, if slavery made race, its larger purpose was to make class, and the fact that the two were made simultaneously by the same process has mystified both. Slavery created a permanent laboring class. Race was a way to identify that class. Greed made slavery, and slavery made race, and then race demanded racism. Berlin was not here original. In 1944, political scientist and future prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Eric Williams, wrote with regard to New World slavery that a racial twist has thereby been given to what is basically an economic phenomenon. Slavery was not born of racism, rather racism was the consequence of slavery. Like Berlin, Williams argued slavery was about having a permanent laboring class, and race proved useful in the new world in marking who was in and out of that class. Racism, or prejudice, didn't cause race-based slavery. Rather, it was used to justify the essentially economic decision to consign a group of people placed in a new category to perpetual bondage. For historians who hold this basic position that slavery made race, the logic works something like this. Crop production in the Americas required significant labor. Landing on Europeans were not all that picky about who did the labor. They experimented with different ways of creating a big labor force, including enslaving Native Americans and the indentured servitude of people we would consider white. Both had problems. Native Americans knew the geography well and had tribal networks and common languages, all of which facilitated successful escape, as well as the possibility of violent retaliation against colonial enslavers. Relying on white indentured servants for the labor force also had significant downsides. As historian Edmund Morgan argued, once death rates for indentured servants began to fall in places like Virginia in the later half of the 17th century, those now freed servants were sometimes owed land. Bringing lots of indentured servants to the colonies once they had a reasonable shot of living to receive what they were owed for their labor put them in competition for land with the big landowners, which the big landowners did not love. In theory, lower class English people could have been enslaved in the Americas, but as historian Barbara Fields notes, if word had gotten back to England that white people were being enslaved once they reached the colonies, no one would have come. Fields also argues that poor white English people had fought for centuries for some of their basic rights to be acknowledged. Politically, it would have been hard to enslave people whose rights, however minuscule, were part of English law and common understanding. Again, the point isn't that elite English people had given poor English people rights because they had some natural racial affinity. Poor English people had won rights and violating those rights when there were more poor people to fight back than rich people to take them on was more trouble than it was worth. 
and in part it wasn't worth the trouble because there was another labor force at hand, the one coming from Africa, often by way of the Caribbean. These people didn't come with guns, they didn't know the land, they didn't have existing networks in America, and they weren't united by language. They didn't have a history of rights they could demand elite landowners respect. By passing laws, elites could mark them off as a distinct group of people who alone were fit for slavery. So that's what elites did. They passed laws saying that slavery was a condition for people they called black, a condition inheritable from the mother and one for which conversion didn't bring freedom. They differentiated between white indentured servants and black people in laws. They created the idea that there was one group of people, people whose skin they now called black, no matter that it might be anything from tan to deep brown, who were made for slavery and another group of people whose skin they referred to as white, although they fell anywhere from ivory to tan to my own delightful combination of dryish yellow and oily red. Those people were not made to be slaves. They, in other words, created races, black and white, for economic reasons. It wasn't mere prejudice. It was greed and a desire for power. And it wasn't simply perpetuated by prejudice. It was encoded in laws. You might even say embedded in laws and in a legal system that placed into the humanly constructed categories white and black precisely to give one of those groups supremacy. Given Florida and North Dakota's definition of what critical race theory is, I think this long-standing historical interpretation would violate it. These definitions outlaw engagement with widely respected historians. Might the historians be wrong? Sure, historians fight with each other. But these arguments are well-sourced and well-reasoned. And I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say that Ira Berlin, Eric Williams, Edmund Morgan, and Barbara Fields did significantly more research to come to their understandings of the relationship among slavery, race, and racism than whoever came up with the definition of critical race theory in Florida and North Dakota. Not allowing students to interact with these historians, particularly in the upper grades, is to deny them interaction with some of the most compelling ways to make sense of the facts. Another challenge for teaching history accurately involves provisions that stipulate what students can and cannot be taught about the country's founding principles or values. The Florida rule also states that instruction may not define American history as something other than the creation of a new nation based largely on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Here, Florida is joined by Texas, which has a similar provision. With respect to their relationship to American values, slavery and racism are anything other than deviations from, betrayals of, or failures to live up to the authentic founding principles of the United States, which include liberty and equality. These laws are more ambiguous, a problem I'll say more about in a bit, but I again worry that this language precludes teachers from introducing interpretations of U.S. history respected historians have made based on meticulous research. Well, let's go back to Edmund Morgan. In his classic book, American Slavery, American Freedom, Morgan wrote, the freedom of the free, the growth of freedom experienced in the American Revolution, depended more than we would like to admit on the enslavement of more than 20% of us at that time. His book shows how Republican freedom came to be supported, at least in large part, by its opposite, slavery. Morgan's book considers this paradox. Virginia was a bastion of democratic republicanism and the largest slaveholding state. It produced the man who wrote that all men are created equal. But that same man also wrote that the only solution to slavery was removing all black people from the country. 
Now, you could just put this down to hypocrisy, which is the take that the Texas law particularly seems to suggest. And that's not crazy. People act differently from their stated beliefs all the time. But Morgan argues, again with evidence, that it wasn't just hypocrisy. Rather, it was a way of resolving a problem for people who believed, as many elite people did, that poor people were not capable of self-government. People who labored all day and didn't own their own land couldn't, the thinking went, be trusted with affairs of state. But someone had to do the kind of labor that makes you unfit for government. You have to have crops and ditches and roads, after all. What transpired in Virginia, according to Morgan, was the adoption of racism to solve a conundrum created by classism, by creating a laboring class deemed unfit for self-government and marked by being black, you could create another class deemed fit for self-government, all the white people, well, all the white men. In other words, the self-evident equality of all white people, regardless of class, depended on there being another class that was manifestly unequal and who would do the labor necessary to allow some people the leisure to read John Locke and write the Declaration of Independence. In Morgan's reading, race-based slavery was part of what made the equality of white men of different classes conceptually tenable for at least some white people. Historian Barbara Fields offers a slightly different perspective, arguing that the language of equality in the Declaration of Independence led to greater racism after the Revolution than had existed before because white slave owners and those who compromised with them by keeping slavery in the new country needed a way to explain why equality did not apply to black people. Before declaring the equality of all people, you didn't really have to justify manifest inequality. But once you had the assertion of equality, you needed to explain continued inequality. Arguing that black people were unfit for self-government was one method. Here again, slavery and racism were wrapped up with the young country's commitment to equality. Interpretations like those of Morgan and Fields not only make sense of how slaveholders could embrace the Declaration's language of equality, but they also make sense of what actually happened in the new nation. While it's certainly the case that the revolution catalyzed the slow process by which northern states ended slavery, it is also clearly the case that some free blacks lost rights they had had before the revolution. And it is also clear that many white Americans define citizenship as for white people, not black people, slave or free. Provisions such as the 1970 Naturalization Act that explicitly limited naturalization to white people indicated that the assumption of citizenship, the assumption that a person was deemed fit to become a part of the new country, was for white people, not black people. Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration, also wrote that the only viable solution to slavery was to begin a process of taking slave children from their parents, raising them to be fit for citizenship, and then sending them somewhere else to be self-governing. In other words, he might have believed that all people were endowed with inalienable rights, but he didn't think they could all live them out in the new country, a country he viewed as belonging to white people. When Missouri sought admittance in the Union in 1820, its state constitution barred free black people from entering the state. A debate in Congress about allowing that law to stand ended with Missouri's constitution being approved, with the caveat that it shouldn't be taken to mean that the rights of citizens from other states could be abridged. And that may sound good, but the debate demonstrated a lack of consensus on whether black people were citizens in the first place. Missouri later enacted laws mandating that the children of free black people be apprenticed to white people. Again, a sign that free black people were not deemed citizens on par with white people. Maryland, starting in the 1830s, had discussions about removing free black people, citizens from the state. Again, that discussion was predicated on the belief that free black people were not citizens in the same way as free white people were. Back to the anti-CRT laws. What do they mean for teaching perspectives of people like Edmund Morgan and Barbara Fields? 
These historians argue that racism was tied into how some white Americans understood equality and freedom. That for some white Americans that universal principles depended upon or catalyzed racism. Are those arguments off the table? And what do we do with the many early laws, in some cases supported by people involved with the revolution, that clearly denied equality and citizenship to black people? Are they not part of the creation of the new nation? Do they tell us nothing of its values? Or with reference to the Florida law, are they the smally part that was not based on universal principles stated in the Declaration? Are we really prepared to say that the first Naturalization Act, for example, an act about who could become a citizen, is a side note in American history and tells us nothing about the nation's values? Now, for me, these cases are slightly different than Florida and North Dakota's provisions mandating that racism be understood as merely prejudice. I'm pretty clear about what those laws mean, and I think they explicitly prohibit teaching sound historical interpretations. The provisions about the Declaration and Universal Principles are, for me, a little ambiguous and what they mean for teaching well-researched, well-argued historians like Morgan and Fields is a little unclear. Maybe those interpretations are okay under the law, but maybe not. And for me, that's a problem for teaching accurate history, because if teachers aren't clear about whether teaching Edmund Morgan is going to put them on the wrong side of the law, whether it might jeopardize their career, their ability to pay back college loans, their health care, I'm concerned that they will stick to what the law clearly allows. And what the law clearly allows is a very nice story that, at best, grossly oversimplifies the historical data. In case you're wondering, I think one way to make sense of the historical data is this. The history of this country is, at least in part, a history of contesting what the words liberty and equality mean and who they apply to. In this telling, the Declaration laid out the vocabulary over which Americans would fight. Clearly, when the Declaration was written, some people disagreed about who was free and equal. In the years after, people continued to disagree. Some people might have argued for slavery, knowing full well that slavery and racism were incompatible with liberty and equality. And yeah, they were hypocrites. Others might really have believed that equality and freedom could only apply to people deemed white. And there were others, many in the North, who believed that slavery should be ended, but who still, when they enacted laws, showed that they did not think black people should have equal rights with white people. And yes, there have always been people calling Americans to extend the meetings of freedom and equality to all people. Maybe think of them as the living Declaration people, those who have seen in the Declaration a broader vision than what the original author intended or what some of the original public understood its meaning to be. I absolutely believe that Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer all better understood the implications of the Declaration of Independence than Jefferson himself. I agree that slavery and racism are incompatible with liberty and equality, properly understood. But I'm less comfortable arguing that they are incompatible with how some people, not all people, but some people, understood them at the time the Declaration was written. I'm uncomfortable saying that the new nation was largely based on universal principles that it regularly violated in its early laws. And I don't think it's clear that there was even a unified understanding of the universal principles to begin with. Basically, I think you are what you regularly do. In the early decades of this country, Americans regularly enacted racist laws or allowed them to stand. That wasn't the only thing Americans did. But it wasn't a small part of the story either, and it tells us something about what the people at the time actually valued. One more set of examples. Multiple states have anti-CRT laws that involve provisions that read something like Oklahoma's. No teacher, administrator, or other employee of a school district charter school or virtual charter school shall require or make part of the course the following concepts. An individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether unconsciously or consciously. 
I'm going to ignore everything related to sex and gender, that's a different series by someone else, and focus on the pieces related to race. Let's start with the language. It's familiar language. These provisions fit well with how we commonly talk about race. I'm white or I'm black. We talk about race as something we are. The problem, however, is that our linguistic shorthand makes race seem essential or biologically real, as if I have some genes or blood that make me white. Again, lots of historians would argue that racial categories were created for largely economic reasons, and then people were placed in them based on arbitrarily chosen physical characteristics. To put it another way, if aliens were to come to our planet tomorrow and were asked to describe my skin color, and yes, in my hypothetical, the aliens communicate readily in English and share our color spectrum, they wouldn't say I'm white. Seriously, look at me. I'm not infrequently asked in January if I have a sunburn. Folks, I live in Minnesota. First, people should freaking stop asking me that because what am I going to say? Yes, I was just tanning in our blizzard. And second, it shows that our racial classifications are constructions. I'm not actually white. I'm placed in the category white. Some scholars are now using terminology like people raced white or people raced black. That may sound like the jargony thing that scholars would write, but it has a point. We aren't biologically, essentially, or ontologically one race or another. We are put into those categories or raced in those ways. So here I get, this gets tricky. Because no one is ontologically or biologically any race, we aren't ontologically or biologically anything that goes along with being that race. Again, no white blood, no black genes. People who are raced white don't have a special oppressor gene. But race was created for reasons, and those reasons have to do with oppression. Remember, people didn't create race in order to emphasize how all humans were created equal. At least according to a lot of historians, Race was created to legitimize oppressive things like slavery and the perpetuation of an underclass. The category white was created to name who could have power, and the category black created to name those who couldn't. So when it comes to the anti-CRT laws, I have concerns. I think that historically, it is accurate to describe the category white as being created for oppression and what some might call privilege. To put it another way, people put into the category white were those whose full humanity was assumed. People raced white also were those accorded, in law, political, economic, and social power, and the ability to oppress other people that comes with that power. Side note, this is not to say that all white people had the same amount of power, but those who had power had it by virtue of being raced white. People put into the black category did not have those powers and had to contest for the recognition of their full humanity. A quicker way to say that is that I think our notions of racial whiteness and blackness, in other words, our construction of race, were designed for oppression. These racial categories were designed to name who could be free and who could be a slave, who could be a citizen and whose citizenship was up for debate, who couldn't have their children sold away from them and who could. And again, I think I'm on solid historical ground here. Not all historians would necessarily agree with that interpretation, but it's a fairly common one in the field, certainly one that has enough consensus to be taught. So. My question, legislatures of several states, does making the argument that race was created for oppressive reasons and that the people placed in the category white were those who could receive the benefits of oppression, does that violate the laws that prohibit teaching the concept that an individual by virtue of the individual's race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive? Remember that I don't believe that I am white or that anyone is any race in a biological, essential, or ontological way. I think we're all placed into categories. I don't think I was born with an oppressive gene, or if I was, it has nothing to do with my skin color. And yes, geneticists of the world, I know there isn't actually an oppressive gene at all. I'm not that bad at science. 
But if, say, a high school history teacher in Oklahoma teaches that the categories themselves were created for oppressive reasons, and one race was given the power of oppression over the other, does that teacher violate the law? And do you really expect teachers paying off college loans or trying to support a family that they're going to risk this nuanced conversation with an ambiguously worded law hanging over their heads? How does this provision enhance our ability to talk in a historically accurate way about where our ideas of race come from and what, and what they've been used for? Now, you may be thinking that teachers have no reason to go anywhere this near in depth. You might say the whole concept is too nuanced and challenging. I, after all, took a good long time explaining it to an audience of what I presume to be adults. But I disagree. I actually think that the ways we talk about race, slavery, and racism are part of our problem. We talk about race as if it were natural or biological. I think our standard explanations of race-based slavery, that white people enslaved black people because they were racist, make racism seem genetic or biological, as if from time immemorial something called white people have recognized other white people as the same as them, and black people as different. I think the language these laws use reinforce the very essentialist notions of race many people who support these laws claim to reject. I think the notion that our racial categories were created for oppression is not an essentialist or biological way of understanding race. It explicitly recognizes that race is a construction, a category, a creation. Yes, I think these concepts are challenging and need to be taught over time in developmentally appropriate ways. But I think that about a lot of things. Imaginary numbers, relativity, Christology. Laws that themselves reinforce the sense that race is something you are, rather than the category into which you are raced, do not aid teachers in navigating these difficult topics. I could make a joke here about fears of teachers indoctrinating students, obviously coming from people who have never tried to get students to read the syllabus. And I think there's some truth to the joke. Believe me, if I had powers of indoctrination, my school would have substantially more religion majors. But I also get the concern. Parents care about what our kids are taught at school. That's why fierce battles have been fought over it. And I am not prepared to say that all schools do a good job teaching about race. Teachers make mistakes. Bad curriculum exists. I get why people are concerned about race being handled badly in schools. But I don't think these laws fix that. In fact, I think they pretty much make it even more likely that race will be taught badly in schools. And as a historian, a parent, and a Christian, I think that's a problem. Now some folks might say that's because I'm one of those lefty academic types who doesn't love our country and who only wants to talk about what it has done wrong. But I don't think that's true. As a Christian, I don't understand love to mean ignoring sin and brokenness. That isn't how God loves us. Rather, love means actively working for someone or something's flourishing. To do that, we need to tell the truth, the good parts as well as the bad. That's why I'm weary of laws that affect the teaching of history, that affect whether we can tell the truth particularly when those laws read more like political messaging rather than products of serious engagement with primary texts and good secondary literature. I'm concerned that what we are branding CRT is, in some cases, really uncomfortable, but accurate history. Christians should be people who love our country in the sense that we're actively working toward its flourishing. With regard to these current debates, I think that means we, as Christians, should distinguish ourselves not by our grasping at political expediency, but by our careful attention to the historical record, by the time we've put into learning about the complexities of the past, and by our desire for all children to learn as accurate a history as possible. That takes way more time than does launching a branding campaign and is a longer term project than winning elections. I hope we're the people who show our love for our neighbors by taking the time.